Good evening. It's 6.39 p.m. and I'd like to call the meeting to order. Uh, we will be moving directly to executive session or should we do a roll? We'll do roll call first. Okay, so I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Burnham to confirm uh, member access. As a preliminary matter, this is Dr. Burnham, superintendent of schools. I will do a roll call to confirm that all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me. Members, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Chairperson Bertrand? Yes. Vice Chairperson Archambo? Yes. Secretary Kelly? Yes. Mr. Leighton? Yes. And Ms. Shapiro? Yes. Staff, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Recording Secretary Ms. Sue Summers? Yes. Business Manager Mr. Michael Cassidy? Yes. And our Athletic Director Mr. James Bunnell? Yes. And I'll turn that back over to you now, Mrs. Bertrand. Thank you. Good evening. In accordance with the requirements of the open meeting law, please be advised that this meeting is being recorded and broadcast over the Lunenburg Public Access Channel and streaming on Facebook Live. And this meeting of the Lunenburg School Committee is being conducted remotely. The town of Lunenburg in response to the COVID-19 coronavirus is currently following the guidance from the Lunenburg Board of Health, Massachusetts Department of Public Health, and the CDC regarding the virus and steps communities can take to prevent the spread and all town facilities are currently closed to the public. In accordance with the governor's order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, GL 30A section 20, all public meetings are being conducted remotely. The order, which you can find posted on the town website on the COVID-19 Information Center page accessed through the town manager's webpage allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so that the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. Ensuring public access does not ensure public participation unless such participation is required by law. This meeting will feature public comment. For this meeting, the Lunenburg School Committee is convening by telephone conference, video conference via Zoom app as posted on the town's website identifying how the public may join. Please note that this meeting is being recorded and that some attendees are participating by video conference. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you and take care not to screen share your computer. Anything you broadcast may be captured by the recording. Meeting business ground rules. We are going, now we are going to turn to the first item on our agenda. Before we do so, permit me to cover some ground rules for effective and clear conduct of our business and to ensure accurate meeting minutes. I, Wendy Bertrand, the chair, will introduce each speaker on the agenda. After they conclude their remarks, I will go down the line of members inviting each by name to provide any comment, questions, or motions. Please hold until your name is called. Further, please remember to mute your phone or computer when you are not speaking. Please remember to speak clearly and in a way that helps generate accurate minutes. For any response, please wait until the chair yields the floor to you and state your name before speaking. If members wish to engage in colloquy with other members, please do so through the chair, taking care to identify yourself. For the items with public comment, after members have spoken, the chair will afford public comment as follows. The chair will first ask members of the public who wish to speak to identify their names and addresses. Then they will be called upon and afforded up to three minutes for any comments. Tonight, we will extend public comment um, if necessary. And finally, each vote taken in this meeting will be conducted by roll call vote. So now that we've gone over that, we are going to move to our first item on the agenda, which is an executive session to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for nego negotiations with union personnel or to conduct collective bargaining sessions or contract negotiations with union personnel. I'm going to so the school the host uh, over to Liz Peterson while we are in executive session.
Okay, so, oh. Sophie, did you have a question? Um, yeah, I actually still didn't receive the email with the link for executive session, so I'm not exactly sure how to join that. I'll, Sophie, I'll take care of forwarding that to you right now. Thank you so much. Okay. Do we need to do a roll call? Yes. yes. Everybody ready? Yes. Mrs. Bertrand? Yes. Mrs. Archambault? Yes. Mr. Leighton? Yes. Mrs. Kelly? Yes. And Ms. Shapiro? Yes. Dr. Burnham, it looks like we're all back. I think we can, uh, we can move on. So thanks to everybody for their patience. Um, while we were in our executive session, I do not have a chair's report tonight. Um, so we will move on to public comment. So this first public comment is related to items specifically on our agenda. So um, anyone who, raise your hand if you've got any public comment. And I can, uh, can I'm not seeing call on. Either. I'm not seeing any either. I'm looking in both the chat and. I will keep looking one last, I'll give one last opportunity here. Any public comment uh, regarding agenda items. All right, then I will, um, we will move on to the next item on our agenda. We are reviewing and approving meeting minutes first from regular session July 29th and August 5th. Did all members have a chance to review those? Yes. Were there okay. any? I did send, uh, this is Brian Layton, and I did send a, a late uh, edit to Dr. Burnham around like six. And those edits were made um, and the minutes were dropped back into the folder. So if, if no one has any other, any additional concerns, I will take a motion to approve both those meeting minutes. Ms. Kelly. This is Laura Kelly. I motion to approve the meeting minutes from the July 29th and August 5th meetings. And a second. Ms. Shapiro. Uh, this is Sophie Shapiro and I second that motion. Ready for roll call? Yes. Mr. Leighton. Aye. Ms. Archambault? Yes. Ms. Kelly? Yes. Ms. Shapiro? Yes. And Mrs. Bertrand? Yes. We do have, a, we line do have, a, we do have a line item tonight. Yes. Um, so there's a quest to move $34 <laughs> um, from the furniture line at the primary school. Uh, to the repair office equipment line. And that's because the warranty on the laminating machine needs to be renewed and the price was increased from $550 to $584. I would recommend approval. Excellent. Any questions or concerns regarding that? If not, I will... Uh... I will take a motion to approve the line item transfer as outlined. Ms. Archambault. Um, I will make, this is Carol Archambault, and I will make a motion to approve the line item transfer as outlined. And a second. Mr. Leighton. Brian Leighton, I second the motion. Okay. Roll call. Mr. Leighton. Yes. Aye. Mrs. Archambault? Yes. Mrs. Kelly? Yes. Ms. Shapiro? Yes. And Mrs. Bertrand? Yes. Thank you very much. Superintendent's report. Yes. 
Superintendent's report. There's a lot to report. <laughs> okay, so we had the staff return to campus this week. Everybody returned on Monday. Um, since they've returned, they've been engaging in safety trainings, social emotional learning workshops, um, instructional technology workshops, and training in new online curriculum resources. Trainings are um, speckled throughout the 10 days. So there's, a, there's time for the teacher planning and prep each day, and there's also um, some PD and training each day. So um, I had a welcome back message for all the staff on Monday morning, and I have visited the buildings this week, and staff are reporting that they're happy to be back, uh, but understandably, many still have high levels of uh, stress and anxiety given the pandemic. Um, but as I chat with them, uh, moving about the building, uh, they're reporting to me that every day it gets a little bit better. They feel a little bit more at ease when they're in the building, which is good news. Um, we are still hearing from our vendor that the Chromebooks will be delivered the week of September 14th. Um, so we're still keeping our fingers crossed that that, that message um, holds. Uh, cohort assignments, I know parents are really anxious uh, to learn the cohort assignments. We have uh, provided the cohort rosters that we have created based on the bus uh, registrations coming in and the remote learning registrations coming in and several other factors. Um, so the bus company currently has those proposed rosters for cohort A and cohort B, and they're reviewing to um, ensure that they will be able to create routes um, and accommodate uh, picking up students in the cohorts as they're designed. If they have suggestions to, you know, ease the facilitation of a, developing a route that we transfer um, some students from cohort A to B or vice versa, that um, that's the information that we're, we're waiting for at this point. And as soon as we get um, a thumbs up from the bus company that they're good to go with developing the bus routes based on the cohort assignment, um, we will be pushing that out. Regardless, we'll, we'll push some information out on Friday at the very latest. Um, regarding the high school, however, we may not be able to push out information on cohort assignments by Friday. We had 93, I think, Mr. Cassidy, was it 93? Uh, students request uh, remote, full remote learning at the high school. And Mr. McGrath and his team are now hand scheduling 93 students, seven classes a day. Um, so it's, it's a pretty big job. And then even after those assignments, we still have to make sure that the cohort is balanced in every single class period because we can only accommodate so many students in the room if they're six feet apart. Um, so Mr. McGrath is hoping to have um, all of this ironed out and kids all scheduled and cohort assignments and student schedules out the middle of next week. Zoom forums, I had uh, two Zoom forums last week. One was for staff and um, in the evening there was another one for families. Uh, both were very well attended. Uh, I responded to staff questions for approximately an hour and to parent questions that same evening for approximately two hours. Um, I have asked that the principals share their school-based reopen plan with families next week and that they host a school-based Zoom forum for families to ask their questions um, and get any clarification relative to the plan that was uh, shared. Flu shots is another uh, area that folks are looking for some information. So I learned that um, all students, all students in Massachusetts will have to have a flu shot by December 31st. As with other immunizations, however, um, 
parents may still seek a medical or religious exemption. Um, Katie McGuire, our health and safety officer, um, is working on a communication with all the information relative to the flu shot, what's required, um, as well as uh, she's been coordinating with the Board of Health to set up a, a community flu clinic here at the middle high school. I believe it will be in mid-October, but all of that information will be part of the communication that's coming out from the health office here in, in the district that we will be pushing out to all families. Uh, we expect to be pushing that information out before the end of the week. Green Community Grant. The town got a $69,000 uh, 2020 Green Community Grant. The school department will have uh, $15,542 for replacement kitchen equipment at Turkey Hill. $3,500 for lighting conversion to LED uh, at the middle high school kitchen and storage room as well as the school receiving area, and $9,900 for the Lunenburg Primary School to modernize the domestic hot water system. Relative to safety, I'd had a question or two from parents uh, regarding students, more students potentially walking to school this year, and if there was any coordinated effort with the police department around safety. Um, I checked in with our SRO, um, Officer McNamara, and he said that the police department um, does have plans to have officers out patrolling and doing speed enforcement on the roads surrounding the schools every morning. Um, however, he does caution that those are the officers that are on patrol. So if um, some other event occurs or an emergency happens, they will be um, drawn away from that area to attend to that um, issue. Um, they're also looking to do some um, crosswalk enforcement as well in and around the school. And lastly, the finance committee. Um, last time we met, I reported that Mr. Cassidy and I had met with Mr. Beardmore at his request, he's serving as the liaison to the finance from the finance committee to the school um, department. Uh, we met again this week. Ms. Delonda joined this meeting, and um, we continued to have some conversation around um, the the long term financial forecast for the town that they're hoping to be able to present at the fall town meeting, and you know what what information we could gather relative to the potential uh, costs or other factors that we would have to be looking at when we're talking about a potential Turkey Hill Elementary School renovation project or new build, et cetera. Um, so, and I think that's all I have for you tonight. Okay. Thank you. We are on to new business, um, which brings us to uh, our athletics update with athletic director, Mr. Bunnell. I will turn it over to him. Yes. Hi, everybody. Um, hi, new members of the school committee. I haven't met you guys yet. I'm sure I'll be getting to know you guys. Um, so I am excited to be here at the same time. Um, very nervous to be here. Um, we finally have some, some information regarding athletics. Um, I, I sent a lot of you, uh, uh, everything that I could possibly put together, um, in a, in a packet and an update, um, the MIA put together a COVID task force, um, and they were working directly with, uh, the state and the EEA with helping to establish guidelines for what we can do for athletics, um, such a vital, important part. Um, these extracurricular activities, not just athletics, but anything that, you know, brings a sense of normalcy to these kids um, during this time is a good thing. Um, and through all this, um, the COVID task force um, 
obtain recommendations from the sport MIA Sports Medicine Committee, which I am a member of. Um, and we've had a plethora of uh, meetings throughout the summertime. Um, I, I sometimes I feel a little undereducated when you're sitting on a, in a Zoom meeting with everybody has PhD or doctor this or doctor that. It's a little intimidating. Um, but nonetheless, um, there was actually a couple members from the EEA, um, two epidemiologists um, that had a lot of input into the modifications that have been released for fall one. Um, and they also had um, some input in the reshuffling uh, of the seasons um, to now squeeze some sports that are still labeled as high risk in between um, winter and spring. So uh, this season will be fun nonetheless. Uh, so where we are today, um, the Midland Wachusett League and the Central Mass Athletic Directors um, trying to get a, a jump on things and, and do something and put something together where um, trying to think outside the box a little bit where things aren't going to be as normal as they normally are <laughs> um, within the league. Um, so we wouldn't be playing teams this year as we might see it have, have seen in years past. And um, the idea behind that was, was to meet the MIA requirements and guidelines suggesting to do more of regional games. Um, the information that I provided to you of what our pod may look like has already changed. Um, I don't know um, all the schools that'll be in our new pod. We hopefully get that information um, next week. We had a, a very long AD meeting this morning. Um, talking about the pods and talking about protocols and you know the biggest thing we we do want to have kids participate in athletics but more importantly we want them to do it in the safest possible possible way that we can offer it and we're trying to coordinate it so that when you go when someone comes to Lunenburg they're going to see something very similar as if they were to go to like Lemonster or Fitchburg or North Middlesex it's so that People aren't second guessing things and, and people can't come back and say, well, no, they're doing it this way over here. How come mm -hmm. you're not doing it? So we're trying to get everything on the same page as best as we possibly can. And as soon as I have that information, um, once it's approved by the district athletic committee, uh, I'll be sending it over to Dr. Burnham to disperse to all of you guys as well. Um, which leads us here to today. Uh, we, we're planning on offering um, boys and girls soccer, uh, boys and girls cross country and field hockey and golf at the high school level this fall. Um, the fall season is started is slated to start on September 18th, which is um, very out of the ordinary as we probably would be well underway our fall season as of right now. Um, but that's the date that the MIA has determined and the season can run all the way through um, November 20th. Um, the idea is within the pod that wherever we're placed in, um, is to come up with at least between 10 to 12 games um, amongst the schools that are in your pod and that'd be traveling both home and away um, and spacing things out so that we have time to, it wouldn't be like a normal everyday thing where I might have two games in the afternoon going on on the front fields, a game on the turf, and then another night game on the turf. It'll be spread out. So where, um, for example, it might be, Monday and Wednesday might be soccer games and Tuesday and Thursday might be field hockey games. So we're staggering things to make it so that the facility is going to be used, but it's going to be used as efficiently and effectively and safely as we possibly can by spacing things out. Um, and you guys will all have that information uh, once I get it all put together and once we receive that from the league, but that's, that's where we are right now. Um, I, tr I tried to put together everything that I think you might have been looking for in that fact um, piece. If you do have any questions, um, I am here to answer them. Uh, I think the last thing in my, I guess, summary slash request um, would be that children, um, students are planning or opting to learn remotely. Um, I. I'm seeking your, your blessing and approval um, to allow them to participate in athletics this, this upcoming fall season. Um, I do feel it's a, it's a very important part of 
trying to get a sense of normally for, for the normalcy for these kids. And um, I would like to recommend that you approve that. I, I, I sent Dr. Burnham that information and spoke to Mr. McGrath about that as well. I think that's all I got. <laughs> Are there, I guess I'd like to turn it over and see if there are any questions among the committee members for Mr. Ball. Anyone has any questions? Brian, Brian. Does. I don't know if Brian. I can or you do. Thanks, Wendy. <laughs> uh, this is Brian Leighton. Uh, I want to thank you for the work on this. I also, I, I like the idea of how the Midland Wachusett League is working on this. I think it's a, it's a very big league, so it's great to have all those minds working together to get a great solution. Um, I just wanted to ask you to just speak a little bit about middle school sports sure. that, about the decision on that. Um, so this was something that none of the athletic directors wanted to make it as, as a decision to cancel middle school athletics, but because of this, the current circumstances that we're under, um, it became an unfortunate necessity in order to facilitate other athletics happening. Um, a lot of districts that are in the Midland Wachusett League had already started to begin to not planning on offering middle school sports, which led to a whole bunch of other questions starting to come up, especially when we're trying to do like the regional pod mentality of at the high school level that wouldn't necessarily fall into the middle school level where not all of those high schools offer middle school programs and where we're trying to keep these kids playing the same schools that became even a bigger problem because there might've been one or two schools that may be offering a program and the rest not, or some sense you would, you would might have to play, go to another pod and we didn't want to do that. And then field space and availability became an issue for, for a lot of schools. Um, so we were trying to, think of best way to handle it and we thought right now because a lot of youth leagues still can operate with under certain guidelines and restrictions so sports are technically still available to them in some way in some shape or form so we were figu figuring that we could focus our attention more at the high school level um, and fortunately enough for Lunenburg um, we we have ongoing waivers that we're able that have been pre-approved in the past for eighth graders um, to participate at the JV level, both boys and girls for soccer and um, seventh and eighth grade students, both boys and girls to participate at the high school level for cross country. So although we're, we don't have, we won't be offering those middle school programs in the fall, there's still an opportunity for some of these students to have the opportunity to compete at the high school level if they so choose. Thank you. Mr. Ball, I had a question uh, uh, relating to that. Um, in an effort to keep numbers small, smaller, obviously, because busing can potentially be an issue. I know that that's, you know, when there are different, you know, solutions being, you know, considered. Um, why waivers to make teams larger um, if we're trying to keep those numbers smaller at, you know, from a, you know, distancing standpoint? Sure. That's a, that's a great question. Um, so normally even with the waivers that we, the two years that I've been here, even with the waivers, we still haven't been able to fill out an entire roster um, on those teams. So within that, we're still well below those numbers. Even if um, more kids decide to come out this year because of the cancellation of middle school sports, the league is working on, numbers um, for both travel rosters and home rosters. So there will be, I guess you could say somewhat of a cap. Um, and that's more of a, it does, the transportation piece does play a role yeah. in that, but that's more of also a facilities piece as well. Right now, the current guidelines, we're only allowed to have 25 people per team on a playing surface and an additional um, 50 people as spectators so we can't make those teams any bigger really than like 20 or so people to to start with so the league is working on putting numbers around that 
based on those guidelines. So we're not, yes, we do have those waivers, but those waivers aren't going to allow me to, to take 50 people on soccer all of a sudden, or a hundred people on cross country, because we still have these other regulations that we have to abide by. And presumably if those numbers are met by high school students, then there would then not there, be middle school pl- there. there. You're yes. absolutely correct. Okay. That's, that's how the waiver works. Um, if we have enough at the high school level, that's where those um, students start to be let go. Um, if there's, let's say, you can have 20 on a team and there's 18 kids from the high school and five middle school kids that decide to try out. So we can only keep two more than three of the, the cuts would have to come from those three middle school kids. You can't displace a high school person. And when, and does it look like it will be a district or league um, decision regarding transportation or will that um, in terms of a decision um, about parent transport and things like that? That's, (laughs) <laughs> that's going to kind of be school by school and district by district okay. um, because everybody's doing different things. Um, you look, you look to our neighbors, Lemonster is completely remote. Um, and North Middlesex is half days every day and air surely is some type of hybrid. So everybody's going to be trying to do something different, um, with our budget busing situation. Um, and not able to have buses until like around the four, four thirty time frame for um, for away games. It, it might make sense in, in some instances where the pods are going to be regionally that we might have to utilize parents that probably would be going to an event anyways, or if a, if someone's coming from learning remotely or they're on their uh, their hybrid day as as at home and not in school they'd be really having to be brought to either the facility or anyways and there might even be some parents that might be a little leery of having their child be transported on a bus and just want to bring them to the location themselves thank you you're welcome any other questions for ad bunnell this is Brian again. Yes. I had a question uh, I didn't know the answer to, but I think it might help the other members um, with their decision. But homeschool students who are interested in playing sports, can you talk about that? Sure. Um, so each district, um, at some point in time, school, uh, the school committee of the district approves allowing homeschool, part- homeschool students to be able to participate in athletics. Um, when I arrived here, the each year you have to submit a form to the MIA, um, and that's one of the questions on there. When I first arrived here as an athletic director, that form was already filled out with that information checked off. Um, so since then, um, we've had, I want to say, a few um, students that that are homeschooled be, uh, participate in athletics. Um, a couple on the baseball team, a couple on the football team, some on the track team. In the couple years that I've been here, um, so they are allowed at some point the school committee agreed that that was okay to do um and so that just continues on until they either don't want to do that anymore or if they're fine with it then they're fine with it but as of right now um the information that i've had uh since since being employed here is that homeschool students are allowed to participate in athletics after school Homeschool, Brian, you are not referring to remote learners, correct? No, but so I guess my point, yeah, my point was, I guess if it's good enough for the homeschool students to be able to participate, then my thought is one remote learner should be able to participate. Um, and I guess my other reasoning I, that I'm going to support this is that a remote student who wants to participate in sports, it might not be their decision. It could be their parents' decision that they are remote. It could be medical reasons. And there's a lot of data and a lot of people who believe that indoors is much different than outdoors and all of these sports are outdoor sports um, and that they would feel safer being in an outdoor environment. 
And my request is only for the fall season. I'm not asking for that was my question for for the winter season or fall to or the spring season yet because as everybody is well aware that it seems like when you wake up in the morning there's like eight new things that have just changed from the day before if not more so this this request is is for the fall season for remote students to be able to participate in fall one sports Will there be, I guess one, one final question I have in terms of this is, is observing, because I think sometimes there's, um, Brian, as you were saying, people have a, 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 you know, looking at data, they're feeling like being outside is safer than being inside because, you know, in thinking if folks are choosing for whatever reason that they want to remote learn versus be in school, that being outside is safer. Looking at students, will there be, um, Mr. Bunnell, how will oversight go? Is that just coaches um, on at practices? I, I'm asking because I observed Great question. Um, all <laughs> summer long, students not social distancing, <laughs> captains practicing all the time in spite of everything, superintendent outside telling them don't be here. They were all doing and they everything that was not in safe practices. So how will that be monitored to ensure that the guidelines that the MIA is putting into place for them, you know, as closely as possible are followed. Yeah, um, no, and that's another, that's another great point, Wendy. Um, so next to building the Great Wall of China around the turf field um, mm -hmm. with like secret eye scans that everybody has to do to get in. <laughs> um, we're going to, um, in order to do this, everything that we have tried to do to make it so that athletics can actually happen these kids and parents need to realize that if they're not following these guidelines in a moment's notice, they can end. And, and I don't think anybody wants to see that happen. Um, myself will be there after school, um, the coaches and for when there is um, a, like game events going on, we're, none of the schools within central mass will be selling tickets to these events. So I was going to use instead of, paying somebody to be a ticket person. I was going to try to get different people to help me be more like contest managers. Um, there are certain guidelines within, you know, we have to keep the social distancing. Everybody needs to be wearing their mask. Um, when a team enters, they're going to enter and go to their spot. Um, each sideline is going to be equipped with these little art projects that me and my daughters did. Um, they're going to be on the fence in a section. So I figured where everybody needs to have a six foot section between them, they're not going to be able to use the benches. So I figured if I were to label a six foot section, you know, one through 20 or one through 22 on, on the fence, you know, Sally knows that she's number one, Billy knows that he's number two. So they would put their stuff there. That's the spot that they can go. They wouldn't be congregating. So when they have to get their water or have to get, you know, switch out their mask. That's the spot that they go and no one else is, no one else enters that spot. That's where their stuff is. So trying to keep it under control that way and stressing to the coaches as well. You know, they're a big part of this. Masks are going to be worn during gameplay, during practices um, by the athletes, um, whether they're playing or whether they're on the sideline. The same with the coaches, spectators, and just game staff. So it's not like they, they're going to be playing without a mask. They have to have that on. Um, there are going to be times where the games have been modified, where there might be now quarters instead of halves, where they're going to have the opportunity to have a mask break. Or, for instance, if I'm on defense in a soccer game and the ball is way up on the other end in, in the offensive zone and no one is around me, I can – pull down my gator or, you know, take off my ear mask to catch my breath. Um, do some, just to get like a quick mask break before the play comes back into, into my area. And once I have all the protocol information from the league, I will be putting all this together in another informative sheet to send out to all the parents and athletes that are registered. Um, that mm -hmm. first day of tryouts, I can tell you, um, is not going to be really a tryout day. Um, the league decided today that that is actually going to be a day where, the coaches and myself are going to be meeting with all the players to go off, 
to go over all of the established protocols of what a sideline looks like. What are you going to do when you arrive at an away game? What you need in your, in your gym bag? What you have to do after a game of practice? Because um, we want to make sure that we can, you know, we don't know how long this opportunity is going to last to be participating in athletics for the fall. Uh, I, you know, and we want to make sure that we can make it last at, uh, as long as we possibly can. So practicing these things with, with the student athletes and, and just going over it and, and stressing how important this is, if they want to play the games that they love, they need to be on the same page as everybody else so we can, we can have a successful season. All right. If committee members, if they're, well, Carol has. Carol. Yes, I Carol. see. Yeah, I see. Ms. Archambault has a question. I was just curious about um, spectators. I know that I have a young granddaughter, and at the field, there can only be a total of fifty people at a time, including spectators. No. So, it, will there be a, at for youth youth things? Oh, not for youth, high school, okay. youth things. Yep. Is there going to be a limit or? or is somebody going to be counting or watching or any of that jazz? And all that jazz, all that jazz. We're gonna, um, <laughs> so <laughs> um, right now the, on the playing surface, you're allowed 50 people maximum. That's including, you know, two teams and the coaching staff, the scorekeeper and the officials mm -hmm. outside of that playing surface. You're allowed another 50 people as of right now. So okay. as, as the league, we're discussing to come up with some type of um, – it'll be like a colored lanyard and like a, a badge tag that'll say um, either Midland Wachusett League or Lunenburg Public Schools. So once a, once a student athlete is rostered, they're going to get either one or two of these badges, and that's the only way that these parents or – parent or guardian, or if, if they want to give one to a parent and a grandparent, whomever they give, those are the only people that would be allowed in the event. If they do not have that badge on, then they would be asked to leave the facility. Okay. Any additional questions or discussion? Then I will, I, we've heard a great deal. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bonnell. Um, if anyone wants to put forward a motion and that, that motion would be tonight, what we're looking at is um, the remote learners ability to play in the fall one season. So just as a point of information, it was on the agenda tonight only as discussion. Uh, oh. So if you if you feel comfortable okay. taking the vote, and I, I apologize, I would I would imagine <laughs> that um, that that most parents would be happy to hear this news um, that remote learners can participate. Um, so I don't I don't think there's any concern that you might want to hold back on a vote right now. Um, but if you do want to make a vote, um, you would just need to make a motion to take a vote before okay. you make a motion to actually approve it. I apologize, Dr. Burr. That's, nope, that's fine. And, and I apologize as well. I thought we were, we were gonna go ahead to vote based on that. So um, if, um, if- As a point of discussion, this is Carol Ashambo. There's no, there's no reason like if we didn't vote tonight and we waited for two weeks to vote, the practicing starts two day on the 18th. Is, did I hear that right? So it would occur um, after the vote. So we wouldn't hold anybody up. And anybody who was being thinking about, should my child be remote, but I really want them to play, that boat has already sailed, right? Yes, but the thing to consider is that um, athletic fees need to be paid. And so, uh, you know, things like buying equipment for, for tryouts, things like that. So that's, 
That's the flip side if we held off. That's 48 hours before everything's happening. So right. for, for, for those that are remote learners, they, they would still have that question as to whether they could play. Brad, Mr. Leighton. Thank you. Uh, my thoughts going into the meeting was that these remote learners, they're, they're already Lunenburg students. And right. I feel like we would need to be taking an action to not let them participate in sports. I feel like the status quo is likely that they are Lunenburg students, that they would be participating and we wouldn't even True. make a vote would be my thought. But if we need to make a vote, I understand that and we could do that. But I would say that the commissioner suggested that this would be a district by district decision. Um, so I, I don't know if you want to formalize it with the, with the vote. Mr. Bunnell? Hi, Mr. Bunnell. If I may, um, just as, um, as the commissioner has suggest or has specified that if a district is, is learning um, any type of remotely, whether they're starting off as a hybrid remote and then going into like the hybrid that we're in, um, they school committee or their district has to approve those athletes to participate. Um, other districts that have done a hybrid like North Middlesex, um, Groton Dunstable, Air Shirley, um, their school committee has approved um, remote learners just because they, it, they fall under that remote learning piece where just in case it, it, we can say that it has been approved by that, that you are allowing those remote learners to participate. If that makes any sense. Yeah. Or did everybody freeze on my computer? <laughs> <laughs> All right, Ms. Shapiro. Hi, um, I guess I would just like to say just one more thing, like kind of in favor of doing this vote tonight, because um, while it, the vote would still happen before sports would begin. I think sports are a big part of a lot of students' social and emotional health, like going into the school year. And I think it's a, it's something for them to get excited about. And like, this is definitely going to be a tough year for everybody. And so I think giving those students that peace of mind, like early on that, like they will presumably be able to play sports, like could be really helpful for them. And like going to school on the first day, knowing that their sports season is going to start soon. Like that could be, just really nice for them like emotionally because like I feel like this is a tough enough time like I don't really see any reason to make them wait you know then I, I will entertain a motion if someone would like to put it forward to as Dr. Burnham said a motion to take a vote tonight Mr. Leighton I'd like to make a motion that we take a vote on this matter tonight. Is there a second? Ms. Kelly? This is Laura Kelly, and I second that motion. All right. Roll and we call. Will roll call. Mr. Leighton? Yes. Mrs. Kelly? Yes. Ms. Shapiro? Yes. Mrs. Archambeau? Yes. And Mrs. Bertrand? Yes. All right, then, then we are ready to have a motion put forward. Mr. Leighton. I'll make a motion that we allow remote students to participate in the fall 2020 season. And a second. Ms. Archambeau. I would second that. Ready for roll call? Yes. Mr. Leighton. Yes. Mrs. Kelly. Yes. Ms. Shapiro. Yes. Mrs. Archambeau? Yes. And Mrs. Bertrand? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Bono. No, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, for, your, for your blessing. I, it's greatly appreciated. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of kids that are going to be very excited to get out there and start participating in fall sports. Thank you. Thank you. So next part of our discussion under new business is bus and remote registrations. So an update, um, the registrations closed last Friday. Um, we did um, take a few additional that came in over the weekend, um, but stopped taking any additional uh, as of Monday. 
So at this point, uh, the numbers are looking pretty favorable uh, for bus transportation. When you take a look and break down the registrations by cohort, assuming that right now the cohorts that have been put forth to the bus company uh, by each of the building principals, if these assignments hold true, um, the numbers look pretty good. Um, and I'm hopeful based on these numbers that I'm also going to hear from the bus company that we can accommodate the transportation for the extended day students. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not going out uh, and making an announcement right now that that's a full on go ahead, but it's looking pretty promising right now. And as soon as I uh, have some confirmation from the bus company, uh, we will certainly be notifying all of the families who are registered for extended day. Um, regarding the fully remote learning uh, registrations, um, we have fewer than 100 at each school in total. Kindergarten, 29 students, grade one, 16, grade two, 37, grade three, 26, grade four, 21, grade five, 39, grade six, 31, grade seven, 25, grade eight, 27, grade nine, 28, grade 10, 20, grade 11, 21, and grade 12, 24. Um, you know, we, we know that these numbers um, may fluctuate in terms of increasing because we, um, we will uh, allow people who planned to start the year hybrid if, you know, um, conditions change and they have a change of heart we can move them into remote, um, but these numbers will not decrease um, over the first quarter because these were the registrations for quarter one. All of these families are committed to the remote learning for the first quarter and they can um, opt out of remote learning and into hybrid um, at the end of uh, quarter one. I can tell you, um, that we are seeing an increase in our homeschooling applications. Um, this is a trend that's happening in every district across the state. Um, our numbers are approaching double normal. Um, I don't have an exact figure for you at this moment, um, but I can tell you that the commissioner is aware of this trend that's happening in um, all the districts. It's not a, a trend that was not anticipated. We expected that there would be families that would opt for homeschooling. Um, the concern really amongst the superintendents is that these students who are opting to homeschool, they are not uh, counted in our enrollment. And the monies that come from the state um, for FY22, next year's budget, will be based on our enrollment October 1st, a month from now. Um, so they, they know that this is a significant problem that we're all facing. Um, I know that they're, they're giving some consideration to uh, something that might, might be done to um, mitigate some of the negative impact on this. Um, stay tuned uh, as things continue to unfold. Um, I'll keep you updated if there are any changes. Uh, the remote learning center. So I talked about the need to help our staff clear the hurdle of childcare so that they could return to work rather than take a, a um, family leave because of the childcare challenge. Um, we will allow for any of our staff who live here in town and their children come to Lunenburg Public Schools, their children can attend Tuesday through Friday. Any of our staff who don't live in town, live in another community, their children attend school in another district, 
those are the folks that we're targeting with this uh, remote learning center. So Mr. Cassidy's had, uh, you know, ongoing conversations with staff over the last three weeks, four weeks. Um, you know, I can let Mr. Cassidy weigh in, but at this point, um, particularly because of the, the way we're going to operate um, with the MOA that we will get to a little bit later. Um, we're at this point where um, the maximum need is one, one day a week, we have, a, we have seven, seven children that need a, a remote learning center placement. Um, Tuesdays and Thursdays, that number drops to four, four children. And on Friday, it drops to two. Um, I alerted you that there were new regulations attached to the governor's order last week, knowing that these sorts of uh, programs, for lack of a better word, would start to be formed to, you know, meet the needs of staff or community, et cetera. Um, the governor uh, decided that they should uh, have some oversight so um, at this point, we can move forward with opening one classroom and meet the needs of our staff for childcare. Um, we have some available seats. I think that the next layer that we would do outreach for would be um, town employees, folks who work here in town who may have some challenge with childcare and uh, assuming that we still have seats available uh, because we can max out at 13 in, any, in, a, in a single room. That's, that's the cap from the state guidelines. If we have seats after we assess whether or not town employees would need this support, um, we would open it up to the community for essential workers. And based on the commissioner's request that we all work to find ways to support childcare challenges for educators so that they can go back to work and teach. When we open to the community, if we can open to the community because we still have seats available, um, the essential workers who would take top priority for placement would be teachers, people who are educators living here in town and their children go to school here, but they work elsewhere. <laughs> so that's the update on, on where we're at. Okay. Thank Questions, you. concerns? What, uh, just, um, just, Ms. Arshamba? Yeah, just to comment that um, I really appreciate the work that's been done to do this, to help the families of our staff and hopefully the families of some of our community members. It's such an unusual circumstance and um, not every district has been as concerned about helping people the way that we, you have done. So really appreciate it. I did have one question. Can you remind us the maximum capacity? 13 to one 13. classroom. Okay. I just wanted to make sure that was out there one more time because we talked about, you know, seven, four, and two. Mm -hmm. So, and I'm assuming those are coming from, from educators whose districts have already put forward their cohorts. These are our staff members um, who live in other communities and yes. their children attend other districts. Yes. So as they've learned um, in the last few weeks, what the model will be in their home district. Um, you know, in some cases, perhaps um, childcare concerns were resolved. Um, in other cases, uh, staff found other um, arrangements for their children. Um, but this was still a, a very good option for um, a fair number of our staff to, to make sure that we could keep them um, teaching. Uh, Mr. Cassidy, do you, do you have anything to add? I know that um, he's done a lot of work 
lots of conversation with staff, um, not only around you know, health concerns and accommodations needed in order to be able to return to work safely, um, leaves of absence, but he has been working uh, diligently and in communication constantly with, with our staff that are having the, or had been having some childcare challenges. Yeah, I, I think the um, uh, one thing that I, I want to add is just the um, you know, teachers that lost daycare due to COVID closures, you know, um, if their day, daycare closed and they, they were having a hard time uh, finding coverage, you know, they were invited um, to join uh, this remote learning center as well. Um, so it's, um, it, you know, th there's, for every employee I, I, I seem to speak with, there was a, a, a different story. And, uh, you know, the, um, our employees want to come back to work. And, um, you know, th this is stressful for them, what to do with their children. So, you know, it's, it's a, this is not a tutoring center, and, and I've made the, you know, we've made that clear. This is, this is a good opportunity. It's going to be safe. It's going to be healthy, and it's going to provide an opportunity for kids and students to do their remote learning uh, on campus close to their, um, uh, to their parent. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm really anxious to, to get it going. I think we're in the final stages of, of, of committing everybody and um, getting it set up. So um, we're in good shape for right now for our staffing. I just wanna alert the school committee. Ms. Kelly. Dr. Burnham, there have been some concerns in the community that the busing times may have to be changed for Turkey Hill. Has there been any talks with the bus company on that so far or are things staying the same? So based on the numbers that we're seeing for registration, um, I'll wait for the bus company to confirm, but I think that the numbers are looking good that we are not gonna have to make that um, adjustment. Perfect, thank you. Of course, if I hear anything otherwise, I will be contacting all of you because we will have to have an emergency meeting to make some plans. <laughs> but I don't, I don't think that that's the case. Okay. All right. Then I think if there's no other questions or concerns, we will move on to an action item regarding the approval of the MOA with the Lunenburg Education Association. And I would also invite Mr. Cassidy to participate in this conversation as well. Um, Mrs. Ashambo was part of the team that worked with the LEA leadership um, to come to an agreement around what this year was going to look like um, for teachers across the district. Um, I think that we had a lot of good dialogue. I think that we were largely um, of the same mind um, around what we mm -hmm. wanted to see happen for teaching and learning for the year ahead. Um, there were a lot of details to work through, um, but that's just the nature of, you know, completely changing <laughs> the model of, of teaching and learning. There are a lot of details to, to think through. So there was a lot of conversation over the last few weeks, um, but we, we got to a place um, really without a, without a lot of um, opposite viewpoints, um, which was nice because there were an awful lot of details to try to work through. Um, one of the most important details that I just wanna make sure that the community is aware of, Monday is a fully remote day all students will be on a remote um, learning day on Monday. And um, after some discussion around pros and cons, um, we agreed that um, staff could work remotely on Mondays. That allows us to close the buildings. Um, as the weather gets a little bit cooler and through the winter months, 
uh, we can be turning the heat down on a Friday afternoon and leaving it down until we're ready to return and open up again on a Tuesday. Additionally, you know, we had thought that we would be um, needing uh, custodial overtime on the weekends uh, for cleaning the building. But if the building is empty on a Monday, it's our first shift custodians that will finish up the deep clean, whatever is not finished um, at the end of shift on Friday. Um, it was also beneficial for many of our staff because interestingly, Monday uh, became a challenge for childcare for many. They had been able to resolve Tuesday through Friday. And for whatever reason, we had a, a fair number of folks that Monday was the challenge. Um, so by doing this, closing the schools and having staff work remotely, we resolved uh, several um, issues that, again, allowed staff to return to teaching. So overall, I think, um, I think it was a good, a good decision, lots of good discussion. Um, and I think, I think we've reached a, a pretty good place. There were two separate agreements, one for the hybrid model and what that looks like, what are expectations, and then another um, for the remote. And that one actually <laughs> took no time because we were all in full agreement that if we go full remote, we're replicating the school schedule and, and we'll be just delivering the normal school day and the normal school schedule. We'll just be doing it on a computer. Um, I know that um, the, the building principals worked to uh, develop um, a reopen plan for each of their buildings um, and, and staff contributed to the development of their reopen plan, you know, down to the details of how things were going to work. What are the protocols? What can we do? What should, what, how's this all going to work for staff? They're currently working on um, a document that would be um, designed for families to communicate out for families what this is all going to look like. Uh, families should be expecting that information next week. Um, and I've asked, as I said, I, I've asked all of the principals to host a Zoom meeting for their families so that they can uh, ask questions. But this, um, this now, this MOA would allow other things to just sort of fall into place from here. Any questions or concerns? Those Zoom meetings that, so that families would have a better idea regarding um, what a day in the life will look like next week, the week gap, mm -hmm. when are there, next yes? Week. Next week. I'd like for families to have, a, you know, a, close to a week to kind of feel a little bit settled about what this year might look like for their children. Um, I know families are anxious to get as much information as they can about what this is going to look like for their, for their kids. And I fully appreciate that. And I honestly fully appreciate the frustration um, having to wait so long for detailed information. Um, but, but settling this MOA actually allows us to now start moving forward and sharing more detailed information. Um, it would have been premature for us to share with parents what, what we thought was going to be the model of day-to-day -day in each of the buildings without an agreed to MOA with the, with the teachers. So now that, you know, if tonight you agree and approve this MOA, um, we can start moving forward. Committee members, any discussion? Wendy? Do we lose yes. Wendy? No, okay. I'm here. Okay. The video, the audio, the video. Oh. Uh, Wendy, Mr. I just Lehman. want to, 
I just wanted to say uh, a thank you to Carol and uh, Dr. Burnham and Mr. Cassidy for going back to back negotiations and getting this done so quickly. And also thank the LEA too for working together and just getting it done quickly and efficiently and effectively and going back to back negotiations. So thank you. I know with negotiations, been in it before that there is some give and take and, and I think this is a good agreement and I support it. Thank you. Thank you. Then I will end if there are no, there's no further discussion or questions or concerns, I will entertain a motion. Mr. Leighton. I'll make a motion to approve the MOA with the Lunenburg Education Association. Is there a second? Ms. Archambault? I will second that. Roll we'll call. Call. Mr. Leighton? Yes. Mrs. Archambault? Yes. Ms. Shapiro? Yes. Mrs. Kelly? You're muted, Mrs. Kelly. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> Mrs. Bertrand. Yes. Excellent. Thank you. Yes. And, and I echo the, the hard work of all involved. It was, there's been a lot of negotiation um, in the last nine months, um, eight months. So I appreciate with, with um, pretty much the same folks involved. So much appreciated. Um, moving on to discuss fees. Um, high school parking fee, um, athletic and facility rental fee. I'm not sure that we have a lot around some of those, but they're all fees that we wanted to discuss. So as part of the Zoom meetings and emails um, that I've been receiving from parents over the last many weeks, um, a couple of parents of high school students asked the question about the parking fee and if the parking fee would be reduced. And given the fact that um, the vast majority of students at the high school and throughout the district will be on campus two days a week, um, I think that it's very reasonable that we should look to reduce the fee and uh, cut it in half. So currently the fee is $50. We're looking to um, reduce that to $25. Um, it's important to note that um, the revenues from these fees, the parking fee, uh, goes to the town's general fund. I had a conversation with the town manager to alert her to the fact that we were gonna uh, be discussing this this evening. Um, she was a little bit concerned because um, the full fee was part of the revenue projection um, that she had done. Um, I, I think I alleviated her concern. Uh, when you think about it like this, we can actually issue more parking permits than we typically do because we have 125 spaces. And in a typical year, we issue 125 parking uh, passes. This year, we essentially can sell the spot, <laughs> if you will, um, twice. The same spot could be occupied by a student on Tuesday and Thursday and by occupied by a different student on Wednesday and Friday. So essentially, um, we're cutting the fee in half, but potentially you're doubling the parking passes that you can issue. So with that, really, there's really no change in the revenue unless we don't, you know, have enough students that are interested in obtaining a parking pass. I'm actually going to recuse myself from this discussion and Ms. Archambeau is going to. All righty. To, to moderate that. All right, Brian, did you have a comment? I, I had a question for the superintendent through you. Um, my question was in regards to a, a wait list. Is there a wait list typically each year? Well, that's a good question. I didn't ask if there's a wait list. Um, I really don't know. I'll have to. I'll have to ask if they typically keep a wait list. 
this year, I would think that we wouldn't need one because no. essentially we'll be able to issue twice as many parking passes. I guess my thought was if we're, are we, wouldn't we be issuing the same amount of parking passes as a usual year? Like the same number of students would be getting the parking passes. So on a Tuesday, Thursday students. cohort, we could issue 125 parking passes for the Tuesday, Thursday cohort. And we can also issue 125 parking passes for the Wednesday, Friday cohort, because they, the, all of these students will not be on the campus at the same time. Uh, Ms. Shapiro? Um, I would also like to add that there's potentially um, like an opportunity for more students to want to purchase a parking pass because they don't feel comfortable going on the bus like they normally would because like I know that there's probably a lot of people who would normally take the bus but like don't feel good about it and so they would be more inclined to purchase a parking pass so that, that might be even more opportunity for the town to generate that money because you'd have more kids interested. I guess my, my question was more of, is there going to be the same number of students applying for a parking pass as a typical year, but then the fee is cut in half? I think potentially there will be more than in a typical year. Um, are there any other questions? Is there any way to find out that information? Is this something that we should wait on to get that information if there's generally a waiting list? So I think that even if there is typically a waiting list, this year the waiting list might be fully accommodated because we can issue more parking passes. Right. I guess, do we know how many spots are typically filled by students? 125. <laughs> yeah, so we, fill, we fill all the spots. Well, Would that be approximately like the size of the senior class? Um, I think that, you know, they also open it up to um, juniors as well. And potentially given the conditions, some parents may feel more comfortable allowing their student to drive themselves to school where yeah. they might not have otherwise. Um, I like the idea of opening it up to, to juniors. I think it'll, it'll be a great opportunity for more students to be able to drive to school. I just worry if the revenue will not line up with last year's and then the town manager is disappointed that they didn't get the revenue that matched their line item. Well, in the big picture of things, um, you know, it's not that much. It's not that much. Um, you know, a, a full issuance of parking passes, uh, the revenue generated is about six thousand dollars. So, you know, it's not it's not as if you know this generates twenty thousand dollars and now we might lose ten thousand dollars. It's a it's a much smaller figure. Um, Ms. Shapiro? Um, just to your point about um, holding off on voting on this, I think that there definitely is like more information to look into, but correct me if I'm wrong, but I think our next meeting is after the start of the school year. And so that would potentially be problematic because people wouldn't know if they could have a parking pass or not. So, so I would the parking passes aren't issued prior to the uh, start of the school year. I think that they apply for those parking passes um, maybe just the day or two in, into that first week. Um, I think we're meeting on the 16th, right? Correct. Yes. It's the first day I, of school. I would be interested in the numbers, just I feel like it might be good to line up the numbers and maybe do a reduced fee rather than a half fee but I'm open to suggestions. Well, my other thought is also that um, as a consumer, 
if I'm using less than half of my parking pass, I don't want to pay the same price. I know when my children, of course, it was in the Stone Age, but when my children went to school, parking passes were like gold. You know, it was it was pulled from a hat who got them. It was ridiculous because um, there wasn't any parking. Now we have a much different facility. So uh, I'm sure that probably isn't quite the case, but it wouldn't surprise me if um, you could just about full um, fill the lot on both cohorts. Wouldn't surprise me at all. Cause I know one of my kids as a sophomore drove to school. Just all matters when your birthday is. So do we want to, um, I don't know if somebody wants to make a motion to either put off this vote or to approve this or um, where would we like to go with this? Uh, Mrs. Kelly? I mean, you just made a very good point of, you know, as a consumer, if you're using this pass, which these kids are going to be using this pass less than half the time, that they really shouldn't be paying full price. So um, I don't know what everyone else's thoughts are, but I'm comfortable going forward and making the motion. But if we also want to wait, I'm fine with that too. Well, what my, I would suggest is you make the motion and then if we enough of us disagree, then the motion goes down. So, um, This is Laura Kelly. I want to make the motion to approve the reduction of the LHS parking fee. And Ms. Shapiro? Uh, this is Sophie Shapiro and I second that motion. All right, then any other comments from anybody? Then I guess we're ready to vote. Okay. Mrs. Kelly? Yes. Ms. Shapiro? Yes. Mr. Leighton? Yes. And Mrs. Oshambo? Yes. And um, Mrs. Bertrand, do you back? I see you back. I am. All righty, so we're on athletic fees. And that's, I will um, confirm with Dr. Burnham, we're not, that's not something we're addressing tonight. No, Correct. we can address it tonight. Uh, the recommendation at this time okay. is that there's no change to the athletic fee. Um, there's added cost for safety uh, supplies, PPE and such. Additionally, the athletic department is going to lo lose uh, gate receipts. Oh, yeah. um, so uh, the recommendation uh, from Mr. Bunnell was that we not make an adjustment uh, to the athletic fee. Um, and lastly, for discussion, um, the facilities fee. Um, so as we think about the added uh, requirements for operating a facility um, with the um, regulations provided by the state for cleaning and um, distancing and PPE and, and, and the like, anticipating that should we be able to move forward with indoor sports this winter, um, is there a need to change the fee? And um, Ms. Delonda feels that there's no need to change the fee structure as it is. Uh, it's just that the invoice for the, the, um, the user would include some additional custodial time um, in the invoice for the added cleaning. So no need to, to re-vote or uh, new, new fees for any of the, um, the existing fees for the facility rental. Um, just the users will have to understand that there will be an added cost for additional custodians. But we already have the fee structure for that. Any questions? Anyone have any questions on that? Mr. Leighton? I had a question uh, about the, the user fee. Is there gonna be notifications sent uh, to those users mm -hmm. just to give them a heads up so they can adjust their fees as needed to? 
So uh, Mr. Lond has been in communication with Mr. Patno. He's typically our winter uh, youth uh, organization user. Um, it seems that uh, they will be waiting until January to make a decision around travel teams. Um, but other than the travel teams, I think that they've decided that they aren't going to have their season. Um, so when the decision is made as to whether or not they're proceeding with the season for their travel roster, um, we will continue to have some conversation. Um, but he is fully aware that, um, you know, we'll have to comply with the, the regulations around the facility use. Um, Ms. Delanda had shared those uh, guidelines with him. Any other questions? All right, then, then we will move on. Um, permission to post stipends for technology trainers and remote learning center coordinator. I'll invite Mr. Cassidy into this conversation. Uh, through uh, the superintendent to the committee. Good evening, this is uh, Mike Cassidy, uh, business manager. And tonight uh, for your consideration, we've identified two uh, stipends that'll assist us in the execution of, uh, um, of our operations uh, for this school year. So the, the first one is, it's called the technology trainer. And uh, it, this is a stipend for, uh, could be multiple um, employees. And these employees would be providing uh, specific training to administrators, uh, teachers, secretaries, paraprofessionals. And these are all after school training and uh, really based upon uh, expertise that they can share to our, uh, our staff members. It's really gonna be targeted to a lot of the new technology uh, that we'll be using uh, this year. Uh, iReady, uh, IXL uh, at the high school will have, um, there's a K3 phonics program that we're, uh, online program that we're gonna be using. Uh, I haven't said this right, it's News. Newsella. Uh, Newzella, I'm sorry. okay, so I still haven't said it right, but Newzella. Uh, so the, these are those programs and once a leader or once a teacher kind of comes out of it as um, kind of the expert and, and defines a lot of the best practices for, for these softwares, uh, they're gonna have an opportunity to share their knowledge with um, other staff members. And it's going to be after school, and it's all are invited. And last year, that emerged naturally um, when we quickly had to transition into remote. Um, there were teachers who stepped up and offered their expertise, designed workshops, and offered and you know delivered workshops even in the evening, seven seven p.m. in the evening. Um, for the first several weeks that we were uh, transitioning into remote so that teachers could all get up to speed with the tools that they had at their disposal. Um, we're adding tools for this year. And, you know, we obviously expect that the staff are going to use them and we want them to use them well. So to have these um, technology trainers working as a team to figure out what kinds of workshops teachers need to continue to um, grow in their uh, skill set as um, teachers in a remote setting, as well as how to optimally utilize all of the, the new resources that we have acquired for them. So it was great that the teachers last year, they volunteered their time, um, but we need that kind of support to continue. Uh, through this year, and I, I think it's only fair that there be some some type of a stipend attached to that work. I, I just wanted to mention for the, for the for these little stipends, they they they'll be grant funded out, out of the Title II grant. Mm -hmm. um, the second position for your uh, consideration this evening is a remote learning center 
Remote Learning Center Coordinator. And this is a stipend position for uh, a staff member who will be take the lead for the day-to-day -day operations of the re Remote Learning Center. Um, they'll be overseeing the day-to-day -day operations, uh, making sure that uh, kids are checked in properly, uh, the, the staff to oversee, uh, create um, creating a schedule, um, j j just kind of filling in uh, the gap of uh, th those duties. So, um, um, it's not an extra burden on the, the current administration. So that funding sources through our, cur our current uh, COVID relief fund mm -hmm. and the elementary and secondary uh, schools emergency relief fund. Those are our two grants. Um, so those are the two positions for your consideration tonight. I would imagine, you know, just based upon um, the, the current state, these are, these are probably one year um, stipends uh, to, to cover our uh, hybrid and, and remote learning year uh, that's in front of us. If you have any questions, uh, I'll, be, I'll be happy to answer them. No questions for Mr. Cassidy. All right, then I will take a motion then. Ms. Archambeau. Um, this is Carol Ashambo, and I would like to make a motion to approve the permission to post the stipends regarding technology trainers and the remote learning center coordinator. Mr. Layton in a second. Yes, this is Brian Layton in a second. Roll call vote. Mrs. Kelly. Yes. Mrs. Archambeau. Yes. Mr. Leighton? Yes. Ms. Shapiro? Yes. And Mrs. Bertrand? Yes. Thank you, Thank everyone. You. Thank you, Mr. Thank Cassidy. You. And we are on to our second public comment. This public comment is open to any topic that the school committee governs. I'm not, I am not seeing, I am not seeing any. No, nothing in the chat either. Yeah, uh, uh, that's what I was doing. I was checking the chat as well. All right, then we are on to reports. The Athletic Advisory, Mr. Leighton. Yes, uh, the Athletic Advisory met on Monday. Um, we talked a lot about safety, um, trying to do fundraisers that are safe. Um, but also um, with the seasons potentially not happening or guidelines happening, just to be cautious as you do the fundraisers, um, but that a lot of these boosters need the funding uh, to provide for the teams to give them support. Um, so the idea would be that they plan them, and if they have to cancel them, they can cancel them, or if they need to cancel, they could cancel. Um, we did have a few fundraisers that got approved. Uh, soccer is going to be selling um, – spray painted nights. They're going to go to your house and, and spray paint you like your driveway or your grass. Um, also be distanced. Uh, if you're interested in getting spray paint, sounds like it's kind of permanent somewhat, but it eventually washes away. If you're not, if you're not interested in the spray painted night, they're also selling magnets too. And then they're going to do a separate fundraiser too for uh, masks. A lot of the, the organizations are doing masks with their logos or their team on it and trying to sell to the players and to the, the parents and the fans. Um, field hockey is going to be doing their calendars um, again, but a little differently with social distancing, uh, more emails, Facebook, um, things like that. Cross country is also going to be doing a mask um, more designed for the cross country runners. And they're going to try to follow what the MIA comes out with as guidelines to get approved uh, different gators and things like that. Um, so they're going to be a little bit differently designed. 
Um, and then we're going to be meeting on November 16th, our next meeting to talk about winter sports as potential fundraisers for those sports as they start typically after Thanksgiving. That was it. Thank you. Finance Committee, Ms. Archambault. All righty. Um, I have two meetings to report on. Uh, they met on August 13th. Um, and when they met, they continued talks about the debt committee and the discussion with the look at um, the major things that are going on in town, possibly in the next five to 10 years, like what's going on at the Passios building and, and how best to manage the debt that will obviously be a part of that. Um, however, during public comments, a discussion ensued regarding the school district's model for remote learning there was some um, speculation about the school district possibly purchasing seats at remote learning um, institutions, as well as concern regarding the poss possible loss of Chapter 70 funds um, during FY22 due to, the, to families choosing to school choice this year, um, as well as homeschooling. Um, during, so that, Conversation went on, but I felt I couldn't jump in and clarify because um, the chair is the spokesperson, not me. So um, I read this statement at the next school committee meeting, which was on August 27th. So I read, as many of you are aware, the school committee chairperson is the sole spokesperson for the school committee. This statement's being shared with the permission of the school committee chair. At the last finance committee meeting, there were many comments involving the school district's remote model. I wish to clarify the remote model the Lunenburg Public Schools will be operating with as school opens this fall with most students participating in a hybrid model. Any student that is registered to attend school remotely will be taught by Lunenburg Public School educators. All educators will receive additional training in remote education, meet regularly with their hybrid teaching peers, teach to the established Lunenburg curriculum, and develop the classroom community within the remote cohort. There are rare cases where a high school student may select a course that other remote students have not selected, such as an upper level foreign language course. In those cases, the school district will arrange for that course to be taught through Edgesir at a cost of $200 per student per course. Otherwise, the school district will teach all remote students. As was brought up by finance committee members at their last meeting, students may choose to attend another school through school choice or choose to homeschool. That is a decision for each family needs to make. All remote registrations need to be in by tomorrow, August 28th so we can adequately plan for each student. Student who registered remotely are welcome to switch to the hybrid model at the end of each quarter if they so desire. I hope this clears up your questions uh, regarding the remote learning plan. As I received no questions afterwards, I am hoping that did clear up everybody's questions. Um, following that statement, the finance committee, um, the finance director reported that at the close of FY20, revenues exceeded the predictions slightly. So the free cash amount is not certified yet, but the um, estimate at this time is free cash for um, the next year will be about um, $644,000 more than this year. And she didn't say why that that would happen. But the town manager was not present, but the finance director reported the town manager was looking at reinstating parts of the pre-COVID FY21 budget. Um, Mr. Beardmore suggested that capital funds should be looked at to bring the school district's technology infrasystem to a level where broadcasting simultaneously from classrooms is possible. He also um, will be meeting with Dr. Berman and Ms. Dr. Burnham and Mr. Cassidy regarding the status of the Turkey Hill building. Their next meeting is September 10th. And that's it. Thank you. Policy subcommittee. We have not met. Okay. PTO. Uh, we also have not met. 
school councils obviously have not met as school has not is not in session. Um, capital planning um, is in process of um, getting their first meeting date together. Uh, it's tentatively September 9th right now, but have not gotten confirmation that members can attend. So uh, it may it may tweak by um, by a week or so. Um, wellness advisory. Uh, we have not met. And Paxal has not met um, oh. either. Uh, TC Passios Building Design Committee. Mr. Leighton. So we also met on Monday. Uh, <laughs> Poor Brian. <laughs> it was fun. It was uh, interesting. We, uh, we did talk about the layout. It's still in that design period of the layout. We also had some guests come to talk uh, about the community space. Uh, Boys and Girls Club was a focus of the, the conversation. Had a lot of people in support of moving the Boys and Girls Club to the TCP. Uh, one of the main reasons was it really gets them to one space, a shorter walk from the school, uh, that they'd have the grassy area, they'd have the gym area available, and it would potentially increase their, their square footage. Um, one concern would be that there would potentially be another vacant building um, if they did move. Um, there was discussion about the school use and the school orientation in TCP of where the classroom should go. Um, and it was brought up that we should have the superintendent there potentially at the next meeting or one of the next meetings um, to kind of give some feedback on that information and potentially talk about the, the Boys and Girls Club building as a potential use too for school use. Um, we meet next on September 10th and then also on September 21st at 6 p.m. Thank you. And the Lifelong Learning Advisory, um, they have not met. Um, so topics for future discussion. Does anyone have a topic they would like to put forward and see brought onto an agenda, followed up on? All right. Then I will take a motion to adjourn. Anyone, Mr. Leighton? Yes, this is Brian Leighton. I'll make a motion to adjourn at 9.09 p.m. Is there a second, Ms. Archambault? This is Carol Archambault. I will second that. Roll call. Mrs. Kelly? Yes. Mrs. Archambault? Yes. Mr. Leighton? Yes. Ms. Shapiro? Yes. And Mrs. Bertrand? Yes. Your turn. Bye, everyone. Uh, have a good night. Thank good you. Time.